I'm Nat, the Head of Community at Exceptional Individuals. We run webinars every single week on subjects from what is neurodiversity, to the history of dyslexia, to the science of autism, and we've been running a series on pop culture, where we've been looking at the pop culture of ADHD, autism, dyspraxia, dyslexia, and it's really interesting because one of the biggest things we do as an organisation and as a community is look to overcome the negative representation of neurodivergence. And you've got to ask yourself, before you, you try to like overcome it and do the education piece, why is there a negative um, aura around it? Why do people assume people with dyslexia are dumb? Why do people assume those with dyspraxia are nothing but clumsy and autistic people are nothing but awkward? It didn't come out of nowhere. And normally public opinion is shaped by media and what is currently popular, such as TV, radio, film, books. So today we're going to be looking at that. And bear in mind, that does mean that they're not all necessarily going to be positive. However, they are a representation and it will help better our understanding on how the rest of the world sees dyspraxia, even if it's not necessarily correct. And I say the rest of the world because the likelihood is I would imagine not very many dyspraxic people were involved around the table when it came to creating these characters. We've also got to do a little bit of a disclaimer. So with unlike dyslexia and autism, there really isn't much official sources of pop culture and dyspraxia. But without further delay, let's crack on. Though today we are focusing on dyspraxia. In a nutshell, Dyspraxia relates to coordination, motor controls, but sometimes it can struggle to process in a timely fashion. So pop culture, what exactly is pop culture? A quick def definition is modern popular culture transmitted via mass media. So anything which is regarded as most common knowledge. So let's take The Simpsons, that's pop culture. You may not watch The Simpsons, but you've definitely heard of it. Or, you know, what's happening in the US or Beyonce. Again, it's not saying that everyone loves it, but everyone does love Beyonce. But what we are saying is that most people would be aware of it. And this could be through radio, TV, internet, any of those sorts of things. It's like just yesterday I watched The Matrix for the first time. Yeah, I know the story off by heart, despite never watching it, because it's kind of like embedded in the psyche. Good film, actually. Uh, the CGI, though, whew, bit dodgy. <laughs> so first of all, let's start off with, have you heard of these dyspraxic celebrities? So when you Google disp dyspraxic celebrities, celebrities, these are the ones that just pop up time and time again. There really isn't that many to choose from. And interestingly, most of you have heard of Florence from Florence and the Machine. So, yep, very out and proud dyspraxic. She's been a great advocate. Uh, Cara Devlevine. I'm pretty certain I'm pronouncing that wrong, but you know what I mean. She's a model, actress, singer. I mean, she's OK at acting, but she's definitely a good model. And but she's also an amazing drummer, which is really interesting, considering her whole profession is about movement, coordination, being able to literally think on your feet. And yet that is still something that she has been diagnosed with, I believe, but definitely resonates with. And David Bailey, I'm not surprised many of you haven't heard of him. He is a really famous photographer. He has done the Rolling Stones. He's done royalty. You know, he's very celebrated. And yeah, also a keen dyspraxic. Dov has said, had heard of Florence, but didn't know she's dyspraxic. Explain her funky slash cool dancing. Absolutely. And I like that. Focusing on the positives, you know, the kind of just like, just freestyling. Helen says, that's so amazing that she's a great drummer. I would love to know how she does it with her dyspraxia. Me too, actually. And I don't have much information, but if you... After today, obviously, do a quick Google and you can or YouTube and you'll see her absolutely smashing it on the drum kit. 
there's this sometimes this misconception about i think models which is probably a discussion for another day but this person is a powerhouse of creativity and i think we haven't seen the last of her talents yet same about shame about suicide squad though but apart from that i have high hopes so film Film is probably one of the biggest influences that most of us are aware of or see. So we're going to look at a few instances, right? And I want to, I cannot stress enough that there is zero evidence on a lot of these that they have dyspraxia. But what is dyspraxia? Dyspraxia is just an accumulation of characteristics, traits and symptoms squashed together under one umbrella term. So with that in mind, this is why I think Jojo from Jojo Rabbits has dyspraxia, or definitely seems to. If you haven't watched this film, Jojo is set in World War II, and oh, sorry, and he's a German, and he uh, he loves Hitler. You know, Hitler's his role model. It, the film's tongue in cheek, by the way. Do not take it too serious. But he's always tripping over everything. He's not a very good boy scout. He, you know, shoelaces, walking, jumping, skipping. And he's so kind of distraught by all of this that he cr comes up with an imaginary friend. And for me, I think it's really great because it shows it being a challenge. But as he goes along, it's very endearing and it becomes one of his strengths. So, yeah, as you can see, it's a good film. And I think there's a lot of things which back up the point that he was at least inspired by dyspraxia. You could see a lot, like, could the word clumsy and dyspraxic be interchangeable when you're looking at references? It's definitely possible, but I find with clumsiness, it's just kind of, okay, oh, you're a bit clumsy. But being dyspraxic is consistent. You know, it could be poor throwing, the ability to tie laces. I don't think many people would say, oh, if you're bad at tying your shoelaces, oh, you're awfully clumsy. It's kind of not really associated with that. That's our first one, Jojo Rabbits. Next one, Bridget Jones. I'm sure all of you are familiar with Bridget Jones. She is your kind of lovable, middle-aged crisis. She's a very clumsy woman. She's trying to navigate her life and it's continuously going to pot. There's a lot of people we mentor, exceptional individuals, that I know very heavily resonate with Bridget. She's consistently falling over herself. So as you can see, she's falling out the cab there. She's always making a fool of herself. She's consistently embarrassed. She's always late to meetings. And out of all of these, I think she there's a very strong case that she was consciously or unconsciously inspired by dyspraxia. It's kind of her whole thing, really. Look, you see, she's trying so hard sometimes, and we will be seeing this later on, that people connect laziness and dyspraxia. But with Bridget, this isn't the case whatsoever. She is anything but lazy. She is a strong, independent, feisty woman. I think, thankfully, by the way, if I haven't mentioned already, I am dyspraxic, so I feel like I can get away with making a few dyspraxic jokes, but typically I wouldn't recommend it. The main one I can think of is Ryan from Doctor Who, and that's only a very small part of his narrative. CP Frio. So I would say in this universe, I would say he does have a lot of dyspraxic qualities. However, if all the droids were like him, I'd probably go against that. Could CP Frio not <laughs> um, have droid dyspraxia? So everyone being represented as clumsy is a misconception. Completely agree with you on that. And Will I be mentioning clumsy a lot in this? Yes, and that's because I think a lot of the media isn't very progressive, very isn't up to date. But this is why for CP Frio, we've got to look at all the categories. So for instance, if he was just clumsy and didn't have the others, I probably wouldn't even consider him. So thought and memory, you think oh, a lot of him finds that quite easy. I mean, it is like pre-built into him. Perception of senses, yeah. Emotions and behaviour, I, I, I agree he finds that quite challenging. He's always sticking his metal foot in it. And speech and language. 
So on judging by this, I would say he has strong characteristics. Uh, maybe not enough for a diagnosis. Now, when we're looking to diagnose someone, and we're not actually doing that, but it's important to understand that you do not have to have like all of the characteristics. You just have to have a selection of them. So for instance, for me, I only, you know, I'm a bit clumsy, my memory's terrible, but I'm okay with my speech and my emotions. So you do not have to have all of them in order to be considered for a diagnosis. It used to be called clumsy child syndrome. It did, and that unfortunately is what most people still refer to it as. Now, this one, I'm not sure all of you will be aware, but um, because, you know, he, he's getting on a bit, but the TV detective Columbo, this one's a bit of a niche one, and feel free to disagree, but he is, he always says, just one more thing, just one more thing. And with dyspraxia, there is, I'll explain that in a minute, but you'll get the idea. He says all the time, he, he does an activity, he walks away, his brain thinks, and then an eye pops into his head and he's like, one more thing, just one more thing. And it's kind of his kind of like, you know, uh, catchphrase, but it's also a very dyspraxic characteristic in terms of not being able to think of what you want to say in the moment. And once some time has passed and the brain has kind of caught up with its thought process, the, the idea then comes clear. We normally talk about dyspraxia as a physical thing, you know, being clumsy, bad at sports, but it can very much affect uh, speaking. Some ways it affects me is I'll be talking really, really fluidly and then I'll just stop. And it doesn't make sense. It's not like I'm consistently slow. It's that sometimes my brain just kind of like hits a block or it kind of gets like, like uh, fuses. That's how I describe it. Helen says, can totally relate to this. Is it to do with issues around working memory as well? Absolutely. Think of it like a big filing cabinet. And every time you want an answer, you have the answer, but you haven't organized your paperwork very well. So you kind of got to go through all the drawers to find the right answer that you want to say. So Columbo absolutely knows his answer, but it's just taken him a little bit longer to find it. I've never actually watched Columbo, actually. I was always more of a uh, murder she wrote kind of guy. But there we are. This one, now we're going all CBBs on our ass. Paperwork, mental paperwork. And have any of you actually watched Tree Fu Tom? Um, I actually haven't. But I watched the trailer. Apparently he's a children's TV show. And I think he's some sort of like pixie or elf. And... As you can see him, he no, I think he was he's a human boy and he was shrunken down and like kind of ant man. And now he's kind of like crime fighting with his little acorn tree friend squirrels, that type of thing. And he actually has dyspraxia. So unlike the others, this one isn't a guess like he is described as a boy with dyspraxia. April says, I've heard of tree food, Tom, and I might have watched it briefly once. Yeah, no, I, I've never seen it popped on. But what makes this one quite an interesting one is this show is all about dancing. <laughs> so as you can see Tom here, he's grooving away. And the idea is to teach children about motor skills. So you know most children's shows are about like, cat, can you say cat? Uh, this is about movement. And actually it's quite a novel idea and really interesting. So it's saying though, even though he has dyspraxia, he still likes dancing, he still likes moving, and he's teaching other people to learn to move their body. And by doing these movements, it kind of creates power or energy. I think it's a cool idea, to be honest. Jenny says, I've seen it a lot. Didn't know he was dyspraxic, though. Yeah, I know, who would have known? Sometimes they don't, they might mention it like once, but when it was like in the development, the, the, I think the, the writers did mention it. It's like power, haha. <laughs> yeah. Now, though uh, this is a good thing, there is a question that needs to be asked. And that is, is this, if, oh, sorry, if dyspraxia is shown as a superpower, a positive or a negative thing? Explain your answer. Because I'm sure a lot of you have been told, oh, you know, I'm neurodiverse. Oh, what's your superpower? Or 
Yeah, no, it's, it's tough being X. There's an, you've got to harness that superpower. And I'm interested to know, do you see that as a really positive thing or, or not? And again, not a right answer on this. Yeah, do you know what? You never know if something's fake or real these days. But, you know, you could have just said, oh, yeah, it's mine. Um, okay, so Amy has says, seem negative because we are always left behind and bullied. Well, thanks for your view, Amy. Not really. More problems than positives. Pos probably greater empathy. Dyspraxia as a superpower could be shown as negative. This is because people with dyspraxia should learn how to embrace it. If people are always told you it's a superpower and you haven't found your superpower yet, you're going to feel broken or less significant. I know with autism, people always, you know, oh, you've got Asperger's. So uh, what's your superpower? What can you do? Can you read the alphabet backwards? Can you remember things from one viewing? And I'm like, no. <laughs> so it can sometimes put very high expectations on you. And it can make you feel very bad when you feel that you do not have them. I think it also can undermine the challenges. It, with representation, it is a balance. You know, there are positives, but there are also challenges. So I think you've got to acknowledge both of them. Another one then. I think it makes people feel better about having dyspraxia, but creates more distinction between people with and without. That's a very true point. It depends on the character. It could be endearing, but really does depend on how it's used. I'd like to see how it can be portrayed as a superpower. Don't think I've really seen it portrayed positively before. Oh no, well, check out Tree Tfu Tom. So Farah says it could be a positive thing because superpower itself is a good thing. It means that you are rare and normally superpowers have their purpose. Absolutely. I would say we're split on this. The jury is still out. Next one is the worst witch. Do any of you remember the worst witch? The one here, Mildred Hubble, that's the one I grew up with on ITV. And I absolutely loved it. It was, you know, I think it was way before um, Harry Potter, at least the films. But if you're a bit younger, you might recognise this one. This is like the modern one. Boo, I hate the remakes. April says... I've just found out that Tree Food Tom was developed in conjunction with the Dyspraxia Foundation. Yes. Oh, yes, April. Thank you. That is very true. They worked with them. There's been a few things, actually, where the Dyspraxia Foundation has, or the Autistic Autism Foundation, you know, have worked with producers and then has kind of left the production once it's kind of went off course a little bit. So the worst witch is completely was definitely not intended to be dyspraxic uh there's plenty of interviews with the people who made it who they never once mentioned it or even hint towards it but yet it also it was based on a book you'll notice like in this trailer here she's continuously making mistakes she's always feeling like a failure so she's always making mistakes she's a bit of a klutz and sometimes she can struggle to think of the right words. Her memory is all over the place. And I think, as one of you rightly mentioned, if we're just looking at clumsiness, that's not a very good depiction of dyspraxia. But when it comes to Mildred in The Worst Witch, she does actually tick a lot of those boxes. And if you had have told me that she was based on a dyspraxic individual characteristics, I would very much believe you. But in this instance, she was not. And I think that's interesting. Sometimes characters are based on dyspraxia, but actually you wouldn't know. And sometimes they aren't based on it, but you would definitely believe it was if you were kind of in the know. So here I says it's an interpretation have suggested that she has dyspraxia. So only people after the show had finished believed she had dyspraxia. Now, this art brings me on to the next question. Is it OK to retrospectively assign characteristics to characters? So, again, once the show has finished, maybe even long after, to look back on it and attach different characteristics, depending on where you are. You might realise why I put Dumbledore on the side. And J.K. Rowling infamously has... Uh, 
made, I guess, uh, Dumbledore gay. But he wasn't gay in the books. You know, I'm completely for representation. But what what good is it to say afterwards, oh, yeah, you know what? He was actually gay. You, you didn't know it. I didn't mention it. I didn't hint towards it. But he is. And sometimes that same thing is also done with dyspraxia, maybe like Bridget Jones. So, but there is a difference. I think, for instance, with The Worst Witch and Bridget Jones, they show a lot of their actions do heavily support it. But with Dumbledore, for example, I would say it's very difficult to find moments in the films or books which explicitly would like red lights. Shauna says, it is kind of implied in the books, but you wouldn't know it if she hadn't announced it. Yeah, like, of course, if you go back in the books once she had told you, then you can start to think, hmm. But I truly do not think that's what she had in mind at the beginning. It's probably, you know, as she became more of a um, social warrior activist uh, until recently, uh, I think she started, like, going back. Um, so here we got, yes, always, okay, mo yes, the, if the creator confirms it, she didn't want Dumbledore to be gay at the beginning, but now she does, but she created it, so she can. Then we got, it doesn't bother me, so whatever, you know, if you say they are, they are, if not, it doesn't really mind. Sometimes if you resonate with someone, does it really matter if it's official or unofficial or post? Then we got, no, it should have been indicated originally i'm in this boat really i mean it's better than nothing you know now when we look at characters we will all say oh, dumbledore and but is it better than nothing i don't know personally i think it's a bit lazy no i don't like the forced representation and some people would just rather not be included at all because it seems so forced We've all seen it when, you know, three best friends and we've got, you know, every colour under the sun. And of course, representation and diversity is really important. But when it's shoved down our face and it sh is seen so artificially, it, it just comes across as fake and people don't really connect with it. That's just my opinion, though, and I'm always interested to hear what you might think on the subject. Mostly around his relationship with Grindelwald. Yeah, I mean, in the newer films, Fantastic Beasts, which are awful, by the way, uh, it's far more implied. Maybe even more than implied. Okay, this is a character which I'm pretty certain not many of you will know. But if you do, surprise me. It's a French animation character, and it's called, like, Stumpy. Well, it's called Hilo, I think. So Mr. Cat diagnosed Stumpy, the weird squirrel thing, uh, with dyspraxia, although Kilo insists he is just lazy. And this is an example of when dyspraxia is displayed as a very negative thing. In this, it is a joke, but it's definitely a negative in this. There's no way around it. They make him look like an idiot. They make him seem very special. And... <sighs> It's straight away is he's lazy and there's like no 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 he's got dyspraxia But as we go along it's kind of like a cat and mouse story and ultimately there's no positive Thing that comes around it. This show is meant to be funny, but I do not think they're laughing with us I think it's very much laughing at us as a trope and this is unfortunately what a lot of people conclude, you know, for instance ADHD oh Naughty, dyspraxia, you know, clumsy and lazy, dyslexic and lazy. And these are some of the most standard negative stereotypes that kind of run society. So if any of you don't know, Ryan, who is this fella here, he is one of the doctor's assistants. And we first meet him when he's riding a bike and falling over. Cliche, I know, but still a positive start. However, what makes him a good role model for dyspraxia is that he never gives up. He is relentless. There's a really tall ladder and he is really terrified of it because he, you know, always puts his foot in the wrong hole or hand. I'm sure you've all been that way. Unfortunately, he's now left Doctor Who as well as uh, Mr. Chaser Man. 
Uh, <laughs> April says, I think the link of the Stompy Climp is unlisted. I can't find the link on it. Yes, it's unlisted just because we do not own the copyright. Jenny says, persistence. Yes, a definite positive attribute. And this is what I say. Yes, I'm not that keen on being a superhero, but I'm also not that keen on being called lazy. So examples like Ryan or Bridget Jones, I like. But Ryan is obviously better because he is officially stated as dyspraxic, like it's intentional. And it also opened up the word and the term to a massive amount of people. Doctor Who is a very worldwide distributed media. So, you know, thanks Doctor Who. It was only a very small part, but it's one of the most positive ones we've had to date. Now, Miranda. Miranda, again, is not officially known. It's a very British comedy, so if you're an American, or, well, anywhere else, you may have not heard about it. It's your very classic slapstick British comedy, which, you know, you love or you hate it. She is really clumsy, but more than clumsy, she is really awkward. I think she's a great one, because she doesn't, it isn't just focused on the clumsiness. As you notice, she has this way with language. She'll find words interesting, or... When some people are like talking, they might pause. Miranda will use like, mm, you know, draw that word. It's like, I have something to tell you. And she does that because the brain is thinking in the background. So it's the exact same thing that we normally talk about with delays. She's also incredibly inappropriate. A lot of the time we think, oh, you know, it's just related to autism. But no, dyspraxia can be inappropriate too. And actually, I think it what makes them very relatable, very endearing, um, very genuine. And that's definitely a characteristic I see in a lot of people we work with with dyspraxia, genuine. Okay, nice. Oh, uh, Farzana, do you have a mess comment? Yeah, I just want to say, is awkwardness a trait of dyspraxia? Whether... It I don't think it's a trait, but it's definitely a, uh, a consequence of dyspraxia. So the fact that the brain has that delay and it's kind of awareness and yes and no. I think it is, but you wouldn't go to a doctor and say, I'm really awkward. Could you diagnose me? It's more that because of the other things, the other characteristics that are that are related to dyspraxia, Awkwardness is sometimes a an output. Who could be more stereotypically dyspraxic than Mr. Bump? It's kind of his thing. So he's always knocking over things, and it's worded actually in the book, which I did read all the way through. The trouble was that Mr. Bump could not stop having little accidents. If there was something for Mr. Bump to bump into, he'd bump into it all right. So again, it's not just a one-off clumsy event, it's a consistent part that affects his entire life. He often gets lost and breaks things. Getting lost is another characteristic of dyspraxia. Um, you know, kind of remembering where you're going, getting your lefts and your rights confused. And he's also a great problem solver. He has this unique ability of always turning um, bad situations into positives. So this is why I think Mr. Bump might be dyspraxic and Miss Whoops, um, but admittedly Miss Whoop was afterwards. Because he's not just clumsy, he does think differently, he is forgetful, but he's also very inventive with his solutions, and he's a key member of the Mr. Men family. Animation. So, Goofy. I give Goofy a 10 out of 10 for possibly being dyspraxic. For those of you, well, everyone knows Goofy. He started off as a subcategory of characters, and then he really started to become his own. He had his own movie, which the Goofy movie, by the way, love it. It, it's, it shows him being himself, which is all over the place, but he's also incredibly empathetic. He's a well-rounded individual. He's also very intelligent. That's the thing. If you actually look at Goofy's like backstory, he's a very intelligent individual. And he also, despite being a backstory pro, he has done everything from skateboarding, fishing, skating, you know, he's done everything. Goofy is a happy-go-lucky individual. He doesn't, oh, he doesn't let things hold you back. 
looking at these with the motion, the way his like leg movements go, it's kind of you know he's very kind of loosey. He's he it's like he doesn't have bones in his limbs, and despite how much pain he looks like he's in, you'll notice that he's always trying new things. He's always very happy. He's an integral part to the Mickey Mouse crew, and let's face it, his movie was better than Mickey Mouse's movie. So I would say, Goofy, you get a 10 out of 10 for possible dyspraxia. And yes, he's a bit of a, he's a bit um, disastrous, but he's also incredibly likable, very intelligent, uh, very empathetic. And I would say he's the glue that holds the House of Mouse together. So these are some of the things which I think makes Goofy a dyspraxic role model. Yes, he has coordination difficulties. He's a bit forgetful. He's easily distracted. He has speech difficulties, trouble with social cues. He's accident prone, but he also has a really big heart. He's very intelligent. And remember, dyspraxia does not affect intelligence. And he's also incredibly positive. So he is not officially dyspraxic. But I think if I was to go back and uh, change the history of any character, this is one that I would mention. Ozana, you got another question? Yeah, I just want to know, when you refer to have, having a big heart, does that mean you're a very gen... Well, yeah. is, that, is that what something which people just have? Yes, so he tends to be very kind and like empathetic so he's able to put himself in other people's situations so if someone is in pain or hurt or struggling he's very good at being aware of that an example in the goofy movie his son max is struggling with social life and isn't that empathetic to goofy's feelings at the start but goofy is very aware that his son is struggling and he goes out his way to help him even though he has his own challenges so that's what I mean by big heart, kind of caring and loving. So Thank April you. says, oh, no worries. Little Miss Whoops is a female counterpart of Mr. Bump. Yes. I'm not really sure how I feel about the Little Misses, to be fair. It's good to have female representation, but if you're just kind of cloning the male version, not so sure. Vesner says, as I said, everyone's authenticity can be released through transcendent meditation. April says, I've seen the Goofy movie and it's very good. I also like the Goof Troop TV series. Nice. I'm not so sure on Goofy Movie 2, but, you know, still still good. Now, <clears throat> Homer Simpson. This is where I want you to tell me whether or not he has enough qualities to merit potentially being dyspraxic. And this is probably one that you've never thought about. You never, No one ever thinks Homer Simpson is dyspraxic, but when you start to really pull it back and look at him, suddenly it kind of adds up. So yeah, he's very clumsy in coordination, his memory's not great, um, his emotional behaviour isn't so self-aware, his speech, perception of senses. Yeah, I don't know. I think Pope's in turn. So who have we missed? This is just where I want to put it out to all of you. Are there any characters on TV, film, books, animation, who you believe might be dyspraxic. And if you're able to succinctly explain why, it would be really interested to know. So if I ever do this webinar again, there may be a few others I can add. I remember, you do not have to have proof because there really isn't proof in any of these. It's more that are there any characters you've watched or witnessed and you resonated with? Bestina says, Mr. Bean. Absolutely. Mr. Bean is a great example. I actually nearly included Mr. Bean, but there just wasn't enough time, unfortunately. Uh, Phoebe from Friends. Yes, I could see that. She's ah, she's so lively, isn't she? And she's very loose, but she's also not very coordinated, but it kind of works for her personality. Tom from Tom and Jerry. Yeah, I could see that. There's a new movie where Tom and Jerry are now 3D. Oh, I don't know if I want to watch it, but I'm, I am a bit curious. John Cheese has done a lot of dyspraxic roles, I think. Oh, thanks, Jenny. I'll have to look at that. Dov, not sure about Homer. Could just be because he's somewhat of an alcoholic. Yeah, I mean, 
I'm not sure if Homer is or not, but it was more just to get us thinking. <laughs> so yeah, alcoholic, dyspraxic, they're not the same. I watched Bart get an elephant, I know April says, I watched Bart gets an elephant episode recently and Homer defines the instructions of using a cleaning product in a well ventilated area. He uses it in the ceiling and he has hallucinations. Yeah, it's interesting. It's hard to know what counts, what doesn't. Farah says, I'm curious to see what degree does the behavior said to be dyspraxic is measured for the person to be diagnosed with dyspraxia. That's a really difficult question. And it it normally is about, are they, do they have these characteristics? Do they have enough of them? Do they affect the life in a significant way? And has it been affecting them for a prolonged period of time? So if you take all those to consideration, possibly. Jim Carrey roles, yeah, I could see that, definitely. Especially like the way he moves. This is a really old one and not necessarily positive, but Frank Spencer from Some Mothers Do Have Them is surely dyspraxic. I don't actually know that character, to be honest with you. But I can def I'll definitely give it a look up. So yeah, that's about, okay, that's most of it for the day, but always worth adding. If any of you have thought, do you know what? This sounds just like me and I'm in the workforce and I'm really struggling. If you get in contact, exceptional individuals can normally support you with a grant. If you're in the UK, super easy. If we're out of the UK, can still be done, but there may be a cost attached, but we can always have a chat about that. Do go on our website, but if anyone has any questions, now is a good time to ask them. Oh, you know, that was a lot today. And I didn't think, you know, it was a hard webinar to create because there's not that much information out on it. But hopefully you've been able to see why representation is important and having someone you can relate to and influence the wider world is positive. Nick says, how do you get tested? That's a big question. And it really depends where you are, your age and everything. For that one in particular, we have a webinar coming up, but I would say contact us and we can have a more of a one-to-one -one chat because it's uh truth be told it's complicated and it, it depends on so many factors uh jenny says do you have a quick summary of dyspraxia symptoms to diagnose it yes we do on our website exceptionalindividuals.com if you go to our neurodiversity page and click on dyspraxia we have a characteristic quiz where you can look at all the characteristics and it will tell you how likely you are to have the characteristics associated with dyspraxia you might have noticed I worded that very carefully, and that's because we do not diagnose it, but we can tell you the likelihood of how much characteristics you have. That's great, lovely, only if I, I only thought dyspraxia affected speech. Well, Stephanie, I'd say today's been a success then. If any of you are interested, we do run webinars every single week, and the subjects are always different. So next week we have the brief history of ADHD, and here we look at from the first time it was coined to right up to modern time. So just go on Eventbrite and search for exceptional individuals or like how you found this one today and you're very welcome to sign up. Ooh, okay, what happens next? Get in contact, here's our details, like and subscribe, ring that bell for notifications, sign up to next ones. That's hopefully everything we've got. If there's anything that I haven't been able to mention, just drop me an email. It's nat at accept.co.uk. But thank you so much for attending today. And it was really great that we can do subjects which have maybe a small appeal, but are incredibly important. All right, whew, we're done. All right, thanks everyone. Really hope you enjoyed it and hope you have a great rest of your day. Oh, Helen, to your question, you think the screener on the website seems to think you wasn't? Are you still here? Um, well, all I'd say is do not take these screeners that seriously. Um, they're a starting point. New insight, certificates. We do not have certificates, uh, Stephanie, but happy to confirm by email that you attended. Thank you. Fab, a lot of food for four. Thanks again, Nat. You're very welcome, Julia. Great session. Thanks, Nat. Thanks. Oh, lovely. Okay, that's good enough for me.